Hello, I'm Sarah Barth, Executive Director of Semper Virens Fund. Thank you for joining us for our Under the Redwoods webinar series in which we explore the beauty, history, science, inspiration, majesty of Redwoods. Um, Semper Virens Fund, as we always do, acknowledges that the Redwood forests in our region, in the Santa Cruz Mountains, where we work, were once the ancestral homes of indigenous peoples who stewarded and cared for these lands before they were forcibly removed. And we are really grateful today to work with their descendants, including the Amamutsun tribal band and the Mwekma Ohlone tribe to help restore some of their cultural and traditional relationships to these magnificent forests. Uh, I know many of you watching have been uh, participated in our webinars in the past, um, but just to remind you that we will take questions uh, from the audience. You can post them in the Q&A section or in the chat section at the bottom of the screen. We are recording this uh, webinar and it will be posted later. So if you miss some of it or you want to share it or you want to watch it again, it'll be available to you afterwards. So post your questions. We'll get to as many of them as we can. As summer is slowly winding to a close, um, the reality is that parts of California and other parts of the world are facing extreme wildfires. And thankfully, we are not seeing major flare-ups here in our region. Instead, I'm really heartened to report that what we're seeing is tremendous resilience in the forests of our region and in the forest communities of our region. And for that, I'm really grateful. Many of you who are participating in this webinar have supported Semper Virens and supported other organizations that are committed to facilitating forest resilience. So thank you for your continued support in that effort. As we all know, if you've been watching these webinars, Redwoods have an incredible uh, tolerance for wildfire, for overcoming it, not the least of which is that they have great reliance on each other to support each other in surviving and thriving through wildfire, through drought, through whatever comes their way. And there is really no one better today to help us understand that um, sense of community among trees, that interconnectedness than our guest, Professor Suzanne Samard. She is the author of this book, Finding the Mother Tree, which I highly recommend. Um, but not only is she an author, she has been pioneering really groundbreaking research into forest ecology uh, in ways that I think will have positive reverberations for generations um, to come. And certainly is relevant to Sumber Virens Fund as we steward our redwood forests that we care for and really relevant, I think, to all land managers uh, globally. So in any case, welcome to Under the Redwoods, Professor Suzanne Samard. And before we actually get started, we're gonna do a Q&A with her today. Um, I wanna take a moment and just say a very personal thank you to her, uh, both for being here and joining us here at Semper Virens, but more significantly because I think the research you're doing really is transformative and is part of uh, the future that may allow us to protect and preserve some of our forests, redwood and otherwise. And finally, and this may not get mentioned as much, but as somebody who often has to try to translate very complex science ideas to the layperson. I really appreciate your commitment, both in your book and in these kinds of speaking engagements to communicate these ideas to the general public so they can understand the decisions that are being made and that will impact their lives going forward. So thank you. <laughs> well, thank you for having me, Sarah. I'm delighted to be here and I'm looking forward to our conversation. Me too. Well, let me start with this concept of interconnectedness. You know, for my entire education in ecological science, my entire career working in conservation, this idea of interconnectedness has only grown with time and research. Uh, my kids, you know, everybody learns about the web of life, the food chain. Um, but even with that sort of understanding that I and others had, I found your book startling and your research startling in terms of revealing the complexity of that interconnectedness. And so for folks on this webinar who may not have read your research papers or may not have read your book, um, could you just give them sort of a uh, summary of the core ideas that you've been exploring? Yeah, I'm happy to do that. So I, I think before I start, I'm just going to tell you that 
You know, I grew up in old forests. I grew up in ancient forests. They're not redwoods, but they're cedar, hemlock, huge white pines, um, Douglas fir. You know, these are mixed, beautiful forests, highly productive forests. And, and I've watched as I've grown up into, a, you know, a 60 year old woman, I've watched the forests around me being cut down. Um, they're at huge risk of wildfire. There's been major wildfires up where I live. And it and it's watching, you know, sort of the change in our forests brought about by humans that has got me concerned about how we view forests and how we manage them in sort of in the post settler world. And, um, you know, in what, using Western scientific thinking, we've always, you know, in forestry, we always thought of trees as, you know, they've got to compete with each other to be the top dog, to be the dominant tree, um, to grow trees quickly um, so we can harvest them again quickly. And, and that means, you know, catering to this idea that, that trees and plants are competitive with, with each other. And so we've um, designed so many practices around this idea. You know, even the act of clear cutting, which is the dominant method of, of forest harvesting, is to get rid of competitors that might um, occlude light from upcoming trees. Um, so there's that. And then there's also the other plants you mentioned that, that redwoods grow in, you know, in communities. They grow in communities of many species. And in forestry, we tend to weed those species out. And so we've simplified the forest over time. And that got me thinking, you know, as our forests have become increasingly at risk, not just from wildfire, but from insects and diseases, and as climate changes, these are amping up, um, that we're missing part of the picture here. And so mm -hmm. that got me going in my doctoral research at Oregon State University to try to see what was going on below ground. And I was really following on some earlier work where um, people had discovered that these fungi, there's a group of fungi called mycorrhizas. They're obligate mutualists where the tree provides photosynthate that the fungus uses to grow mycelium through the soil, packs the soil with mycelium, picks up nutrients and water and brings it back to the tree in this exchange, this mutualistic exchange. Well, it turns out um, that building on earlier work that I discovered that these, these fungi actually link trees below ground in our forests in the Pacific Northwest. So my forests where I grew up, my old growth forests are all linked. <laughs> all the trees are inter interwoven by a community of fungi that is diverse that has you know, many, many roles in uptake of nutrients, um, protecting roots against disease, um, increasing the longevity of roots. There's so many roles. They store carbon in soils. Um, and and we, we often, we just didn't even know about it, or at least we didn't know it about it the last hundred years. So I'm gonna qualify that to say that our Aboriginal people actually have written and talked about these networks for a long time. And, um, and so there's a long, you know, millennial understanding, and I don't mean millennial in terms of kids, but, yeah. you know, so, I mean, in the past millennia, this understanding has been there. And I think we're just kind of rediscovering our roots, basically, about these connections. And it does have profound implications for how we manage our forests, look after our forests, and help them as climate is changing. Well, and I was struck both in reading your book and thinking about it, that this idea of competition versus collaboration is such a metaphor for what's happening in our world societally right now. Um, and it plays out even in simple things, like I'm remembering my dad's guidance to me in gardening, that you pull out every other carrot to make sure that the remaining carrots, you know, grow big. <laughs> and I thought, you know, I think we really have gotten it quite wrong. Um, and the other thing I was struck by that sort of lit up for me as I was thinking about both your book and your comments now is this increasing understanding of the microbiome in, hum in humans, in our human biology, and how oblivious we were to all of that. Mm -hmm. And yet it seems to be increasingly understood how deeply collaborative we are with them or they are with us. And so this idea that fungus, you know, that we never see is part of the survival of a 1500 year old redwood tree, I think is phenomenal. And yet also kind of makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah, and you know, really the, the fungal networks, which are brilliant because they're physical and we can imagine what they look like because we have an imagination of what networks look like already. We yeah. see them in our landscapes, how our watersheds are linked together by creeks and rivers, how um, mountain ranges are bleed into one another, how our, we, we bi use biomimicry to emulate that in our, in our, 
our transportation systems and our, our social systems are, are the same. Our road networks are networks like that. And, um, and I think that, so in some ways, the fungal network is a beautiful um, way to visualize this, but I wanted to emphasize that it's not the only network in forest. The forest is networked by all the creatures. So, so for example, the, the fungi are covered with bacteria, a microbiome of itself. Mm. You know, so there are these biofilms that go along the, the fungal and they the fungal networks and they, they get carbon from the fungi that drives their own life cycle. And they're also, you know, pred preyed upon um, by nematodes and mites and spiders, which also have networks, which, you know, and they have a food chain that is responsible for cycling carbon and nutrients and, and, and imperative in water cycling as well. And, and, and so I, I just want to everybody to, to expand your mind out from the, net, the fungal network a bit and realize that it's all a big cooperative and, and sophisticated relationships below ground, competitive as well but that they're linked together, they're interactive, they're constantly in communication. And these networks exist above ground too. Like for example, I'm gonna just with this one example of how birds form networks. I mean, we don't often think of them doing that, but they actually you know, have nests and trees and they share nests that as the nest or the hole, the cavities decay over time, that other creatures move in and use those nests. So a, a, a nest that might be, uh, excavated by a woodpecker would eventually be used by a marbled murrelet, for example, and eventually used maybe by, by um, bigger animals, like ultimately bears can even use them. And so there are these nest webs interacting as well as these below ground webs. And I think that that's totally fascinating. So it is, and, and it also is interesting to think about the parallels with uh, the internet and social networks among humanity. It's so many parallels maybe hopefully some lessons from nature to us. But anyway, um, I'm just curious as you look back on your work mm -hmm. and uh, I mean, you're so in it, it may be, this may be a very hard question, but I'm curious what you find most surprising or revelatory about what you are discovering. Um, because to me, it, it all sounds uh, like it just opens up a whole lot of new concepts about how to think about the natural world and our place in it. Uh, so I'm curious how you, what you think it, it in retrospect will prove to be the most significant or yeah, revelatory is the word I want. <laughs> yeah, you know, I've been on this, on this discovery path for a long time. Yeah. My, my entire career, 40 years of yeah, you know, learning new things. And each time I'm surprised and delighted and thrilled. And so I can't say there's any single one thing, but there are so many cool things. So um, for example, I'll just name a few. And yeah, then tell I, us, tell us some of your coolest things yeah, and of the I'm moment. Gonna, and then I'm going to end with, I think, what is the coolest? So, um, so for one, that, that, you know, that trees are connected, that's brilliant in itself. Yeah. And they trade not just water and nutrients and carbon, but they trade information. Right? Yeah, that I found amazing to, to read. Amazing. Like they can convey how they're related to each other. They can, you know, convey how they're doing. Hey, I'm doing well today. Hey, I've got lots of extra water. And, and they can transmit this information and then transmit the resource itself at the same time. They, they convey, you know, how they can defend themselves and tell their neighbor how to defend themselves. And they do this through transmission of, you know, enzymes and hormones and, and the languages, you know, we're only starting to uncover it, but it's sophisticated. And what I understand is it's mostly, a lot of it is carbon-based, which is carbon is the backbone of, of, these, of these communication molecules and they're dissolved in water. So water is also part of it. Um, but that's really cool because we, again, we come back to carbon as like one of the most essential elements as in our, our natural world. And it's not just in the structure of things, but it's in how the met metabolism and how they uh, communicate information too. Another cool thing is that, that trees can recognize their kin. You know, yeah. that is amazing, right? Yeah. We think of ourselves, of course, we recognize our children and, and we know that our, our dogs recognize their own puppies and, um, and fish recognize their own fry. And, 
But for this to happen in the plant world is like mind blowing, really. I, I, and I think it maybe to me, it just illustrates how maybe blind we've been about plants. Um, why didn't we even think of this? But I, I think that we just felt so removed and they're so different than us. That how could they possibly have these kinds of qualities? But it turns out they do. They recognize which seedlings around them are their own. They, they transmit information and resources to them to increase their survival, which makes sense because you know they want their genes to move on to the next generations. But I find that incredible. I think another incredible thing, <laughs> I can go on and on, but that salmon, like salmon ends up in trees, right? That the, 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 the nitrogen of salmon is embedded in the tree rings. And that's only because we've looked at salmon nitrogen. What about all the other creatures in the forest? Yeah. What yeah. about our own DNA, you know, our own nitrogen? I mean, when we're buried among trees, it makes sense we decompose and end up inside those trees. Yeah. Another yeah. incredible thing I'm going to just end with is that this has been known for so long. When I talk to the Aboriginal people, they go, well, of course we're all connected. And where have you guys been? <laughs> you know? Yeah, I feel like that. I, I say that to myself, where have I been? And when I, when I started working with the Aboriginal people and like struggling for so long with the forest industry to try to understand about connection and collaboration and hitting a brick wall with it. Um, and finally talking to my Aboriginal friends and going, ah, that's it. They've under, they, they've got this. We're all in this together. We're we're one. We are all interconnected. So I'm gonna I'm gonna stop at that. But yeah. That okay. Is well, I want to come back to that. Um, but before we do that, and I also want to make sure we ask about the implications of all of this. But but one more sort of foundational question for the audience about your research. You alluded to it, but I think it's worth highlighting. Your book is refers to the mother tree. And there are some really deep concepts, both metaphorical and literal, regarding this idea of the mother tree. Can you just give people kind of the, you know, 30 second, or it can be longer than 30 seconds, but the, what do you mean by mother tree? What does it mean in this context? Because I think it's such a core concept. And for people who care about redwood forests, they may already have kind of an intuitive understanding of it because of how redwoods grow and regrow and things like that. But, but yeah, if you could share that, that would be great. Yeah, so the mother trees literally are just the biggest trees in the forest. And usually they're the oldest, usually age and size are, are correlated. Um, and, and so they're the ones that are way up in the, dom well, foresters call them dominant trees. And, um, and they produce seed. They have huge mycorrhizal networks, fungal networks. When they produce the seed, the seed germinates among the networks of these old trees. And then these, these, these trees transmit water and carbon and nutrients and they basically bootstrap those seedlings so that they can be uh went until they've got their own leaf area where they can produce their own uh carbohydrates to support themselves but also these little trees are able to just tap into this vast network of the elders already and and so our research showing that it really does enhance the survivorship of seedlings of the regeneration it enhances their growth and that these old trees have agency in the regeneration of the upcoming forest is a very nurturing concept. And so that's why I settled on the term, the mother tree. Um, and, you know, we actually did map what these networks look in forests and what emerges out of that map is that these old trees are the most highly connected. Um, they're kind of the nucleus of the forest. They have huge root systems with many mycorrhizal fun fungal root tips and they're connected to, to all the trees around them if they're in the same mycorrhizal guild. Um, and so, yeah, they really are, you know, the matriarchs of the forest for all those reasons. Yeah, and I loved that you called them the mothers. I mean, I, the mother tree, that concept is very evocative, very powerful. So, um, well, I, let's pivot to the implications of your work for groups like ours who own and care for forests, for public land managers, for the timber industry. Um, I know in our part of the world, we have lost many of our mother trees, redwood and otherwise. And uh, so Semper Virens Fund and many of our sister organizations have prioritized preservation of those that are remaining. Um, and I think we did it because we understood they were key for habitat and we understood um, 
some of the benefits, but I don't think we fully understood what you're describing. And now that you 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 do, uh, my sense is that they only become even more important to protect. And so, is that right? Is that what you are advising to land managers? What? How is? How are your research ideas? How should they translate into forest management practices? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And there's many, I think there's many paths we could go on this, but I'll just hit the nail on the head first in that, you know, these, these old trees, these mother trees, they produce the seed. I mean, redwoods themselves live for thousands of years. And so they've seen, you know, a lot of time, a lot of climatic yeah. variation, and that is encoded in the DNA and their seeds. And so you know, younger trees aren't going to have that same historical DNA variation yep. um, to produce seeds that are going to help us, you know, help trees be resilient as climate goes through these even wilder variations as climate changes. So it's absolutely essential that we keep the old ones around just for the seed alone. Um, and then, of course, these old trees, like they do, they, they are, you know, invaluable in in protecting new regeneration. And so I actually have a project up in Canada called the Mother Tree Project. And I think it, it, it can inform any, you know, any forest in the world. But what we're finding is, you know, we're trying to find alternatives to clear cutting, which is what is happening in Canada at an yep. alarming rate. Um, it's happened in the US, it continues on. Um, and clear cutting actually removes these legacies. It removes the oldest, biggest trees because they're the most valuable. And, and what we're finding is that these old trees are essential in the regeneration of the forest, especially as we try to migrate seed to keep up with the velocity of climate change. So as human beings move seed northward or into cooler climates, upward in elevation, because our trees can't adapt as fast as climate is changing, it's gonna be up to us humans to try and help them along that what we're finding in our mother tree project is that the survival of the seedlings increases by 30% if they're under the canopy of the old mother trees. So, so it's by, really the seed bank of the future for, for new, new areas that may need to be colonized as forests because of climate change. Yes, it's wow. the seed bank and it's the protection as well. And the mother trees not only provide those protective parts, they also house carbon. <laughs> and um, and they yeah. and by being there, they also keep carbon stable in soils. And the networks that they support also help stabilize that carbon pool. And I can't emphasize enough that you know the redwoods, um, our coastal cedar forests in the north, and the Sitka spruce forests in Alaska. These forests are carbon hotspots in the world. And with that, they're also biodiversity hotspots. And we need to save these because when we lose these forests, not just do we lo lose the gene pools and the biodiversity, we have a positive feedback to climate change. And there's a direct link between losing these old forests and the fires <laughs> that are being ignited by lightning and, and our heating climate. So yeah, so these old trees, they, they play essential roles in all of those things. So one of the things we've done and I am curious to see if you think this is the right track, is where we don't have mother trees, where the old growth has been removed recently or long ago. We've taken uh, second growth forests and tried to, through forest management practices, tried to facilitate development of old growth characteristics um, to hasten those qualities. But I'm curious, it's not just a matter of growing big, it's all these other subterranean networks that they need to develop and whatnot. Is it even possible then, in your understanding of what makes old growth special, is that something we really can realize with these kinds of forest management practices? Is that yeah. something you'd recommend or is it kind of foolhardy because only time can produce that depth of benefit in of what a true old growth tree would, would provide? No, I think I think that you know, you know, people have been interacting and and shaping forests forever. As long as there's been people around, yeah, yeah. Well, we interact. Yeah. We, we belong together, and 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 so you know, stewarding those characteristics of an old growth forest is what we need to do. Yeah, and, and we've been doing it for a long, long time. Like I think about you know um, the Haida people, for example they depend on western red cedar as the tree of life and um, they they strip bark for baskets those those trees 
those um, can be then, you know, over multiple generations of stripping out become of the bark, become a little hollowed out, and that becomes a canoe tree. And so that is a kind of stewardship, right? Yeah. To create yeah. old trees. Um, yeah. You know, and, and nurturing the ones that are going to be the totems of the future. So, yeah, I mean, it is, we can do this. We, we yeah. have a history of doing it. We, we, we've been successful at this. And so I think, yeah, and, I, and I'm recommending the same thing in our forests of Canada is take these second growth forests and focus away, you know, whatever harvesting that we do do, we focus on harvesting in these second growth forests so we can leave the old growth to continue to store carbon and house that precious biodiversity focus any management experts on these second growth forests. And when we do to leave these old trees behind, the oldest and biggest, and look after them and foster the regeneration around them and create the structure because that vertical structure, horizontal structure provides niches for many other species to come in. So eventually as they get old enough, yeah, the marble mural that will come back. Yeah, the spotted owl will come back. The speckled belly lichens will come back. The fungi, as the trees get older, they'll turn over and the communities will become change and become richer, you know, more species rich. It all, it matters. And, and that yeah. is the right approach to take. Yeah. Well, that's reassuring. <laughs> um, but I'm curious more broadly, because we're, we're like your target audience, right? Everybody who's watching you right now and everybody who supports Summer Byron's Fund, we're all forest lovers and, you know, biased in that direction. So I'm curious, you know, I could imagine, and you document in your book that your ideas for some people are probably hard to accept. They're very different. You have all kinds of science backing you up and it's not, I mean, you've been at this, as you said, for 40 years. So it's not like you just came up with this idea yesterday. How, how are you seeing forest management practices, conservation efforts in your country change? How are your ideas being adopted and accepted? And are you seeing any of it being accepted down here in the states yeah those are great questions so you know what the vast majority of the people i talk to they this makes sense to them yeah that connection is is, is part of forest that is it's the relationships between all the creatures that create a forest yeah and connection is about relationship as well and so when they learn about these fungal connections below ground and that trees form basically families and communities and societies, they, so many people say, I always knew this, right? I knew this makes sense to me. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, we grew up, these, are, these trees and societies are our ancestors, these plant communities are our ancestors and we come from them. And so we have adopted and, and, and evolved with these same similar characteristics. So yes, it makes sense. Um, yeah, we are it, nature. So why are we shocked? Yes. <laughs> at um, the parallels. The parallels. The resistance comes more from, from the, um, the, the industry, which can become really recalcitrant to new ideas. And, yes. and not that the people are recalcitrant to ideas. It's just that there's infrastructure is built up around these industries. And so there's a resistance yeah. to change that infrastructure. So, yeah. so, you know, the logging companies, you know, they're geared to clear cut old trees. They're not gonna wanna change their mills and equipment. Yeah. The yeah. herbicide companies, they've developed all these herbicides to kill plants. They're continuing to try to sell yeah. that. You know, the geneticists are all trying to, uh, you know, to breed trees that grow tall and big and be competitors not trees that put more carbon below ground, for example, yeah, or yeah. biodiversity. And so you can quickly see how there's a lot of money behind all of this. Yeah. And to get people to change and say, actually, you need to leave, you know, clusters of old trees when the, and, and all those native plants and protect the fungi too. Um, it's like, oh, no, we can't do that. That's way too expensive. We'll lose yeah. too much money. But the fact of the matter is that we're losing anyway. <laughs> it's yeah. just they're not the ones that are losing. It's the rest of us. It's like privatize the profits, publicize the risk. And that's what we're seeing today. And I think that, um, you know, the public, ex, you know, acknowledging and, and taking in their hearts that this is how forests grow and then pushing the industry to change because we have to we have to change. It has yeah. to well, there's very strong parallels to what's happening with the fossil fuel industry as well, where even, even some of those companies that have now brought into their energy portfolio renewables, they've so much invested and so much 
uh, government subsidies supporting the old model of energy, dirty energy, that letting go of it is going to be, it has been excruciating and is not happening at a very rapid pace. Mm -hmm. I, I can see that. Um, do you do you see signs of hope? Do you see some practices changing? Or is it really still the old way despite this mounting evidence? Yeah. And I, I interpreted your research to suggest it's not just that, you know, this is good for nature lovers, but that actually their own forest production would be greater if they followed some of these forest management practices. But yeah. to do that, you have to let go of the old and embrace the new. Yes. Yeah. So there, so just the, this latter part um, that the, the forest companies will be, you know, if we stay in this model of companies logging that they are going to have more productive forests if they leave yeah. these old trees behind. What I'm seeing in the Canadian forests is that the clear cuts where we plant monocultures, the pines that we're planting, half of them don't make it past 20 years old. Yeah. yeah. We've got so many infestations of insects and pathogens because they're stressed out. They're, you know, they're they're, they're used to growing in diverse communities and we're, we've put them alone and and gotten rid of their productive neighbors like the alders and the birches and the huckleberries and and so they're not doing well and so you know if these forest companies want to come come back and log in the future well they're not going to have much you're not yeah. going to have the same thing coming back and and i have to say in british columbia you know after logging the old growth the productivity of the the second and third growth stands is only about a third mm -hmm. of what the old growth forests were part of it is because we just don't let them grow past 50 or yeah years. yeah but the other part is that these trees need biodiversity to remain healthy. Yeah. Um, as far as changes in the industry, you know what? We are going through massive change right now. And, and, we, and I say this because, you know, people are aware. They can, make, they can connect the dots, right? People have connected the, the dots between over-harvesting and climate change and wildfire. And, and now, you know, the United Nations just, and the IPCC just came out and said, we're in a climate crisis. We're feeling that every day, the fires, the hurricanes, you know, it's the heat dome. It goes on and on. We're living this reality and people are saying, wait a minute, why are we on this sort of suicidal track of getting rid of the very things that are going to save us from this climate catastrophe. And so, you know, the protests that are happening around the world, including in my own neck of the woods at Ferry Creek, where a thousand people have been arrested and are chaining themselves to trees and up in, in treetops is because they know. They know their lives depend on it. And, and the fight from the industry and government is huge. They don't want to change. But you know what? They're going to be forced to change because this is not going to stop. So I would say we are on the cusp of massive change, but we don't see it in the practices yet. Yeah. Well, I will tell you, maybe as a harbinger of hope for you in your region, in our region, um, I will give a shout out to our timber industry in this part of the Redwood Belt. They're still harvesting more trees than I would want them to harvest. Uh, but that's because I don't look at those trees as a commodity. But understanding that they do, um, I, they do very selective logging. And I think it's done, it, nobody is clear cutting down here. Um, you, we are seeing some pretty aggressive logging of live trees post fire, salvage logging. That's not ideal. Um, it's not good. But, uh, but in general, I think our, our local timber industry is, is, uh, is quite responsible. And so that gives me hope if, if, other, um, if other industries and other sectors, other um, forests could mimic that, we'd be in much better shape. Now it also helps that Redwood is an incredibly valuable uh, lumber. And so they can afford to perhaps be more selective than you might be in other kinds of forests. But nonetheless, it's to say it can happen and it's happening in our region. Doesn't mean everything's perfect here. Yeah. But it does mean I've seen changes in practices and to yeah. the, the better. And, you know, it was really the social movement that caused right. that, right? It was right. the new forest plan. It, it, was the, it was the protests in the 80s and 90s yeah. that, that made that happen. And, and in Canada, we're just a little bit further behind. But it's the protests that are going to cause this to shift as well. And already, um, you know, the industry part arm of the government, which is called the BC Timber Sales, is saying we're going to move to partial cutting. We call it like selection cutting or selective cutting. Yeah. 
Because the people want it and the yeah. ecology makes sense. And yeah, yeah. yeah so it's going to happen and we are going to, and, and there's lots of proof that it works really well. Yeah. <laughs> for us. Yeah. I just, for the audience, I, I'm not hearing you say, and I'm not saying there should be no logging. It's a question of doing it in ways that are sustainable. Yeah. Um, yeah. Responsible logging. Yeah. Responsible. Yeah. So I want to um, pivot to uh, a discussion about um, the challenges you face trying to influence change. Uh, you talked about it quite a bit in your book, um, what a male dominated field forestry is, what at least in our, in, in, in this country, uh, certainly within the sciences, women remain underrepresented. It's changing, but very slowly. Um, and I'm curious whether you think that has made it harder for these ideas that you're espousing to be accepted um, or whether it didn't, didn't really matter. No, it, it's, it's a big deal. Um, you know, so I entered the forest industry or forest sector or whatever profession when I was, tw I was 20. So I was a young or 19. So I was a vulnerable young woman. And yeah, yeah I mean, the you know, you couldn't get certain jobs, you, you know, the barriers were huge, or even not just the hard barriers, the subtle barriers, and, and those continue on, um, but it is getting better, but, you know, it, it, it surprises you in all kinds of corners that it's still there, and I think the more presence of women in, in this profession is better. I think that the biggest, you know, one of the big travesties of not having women involved from the get-go is that we see things in a different way, yeah. right? We, we, and I never realized this myself, but just, you know, um, as I was growing up, but just, you know, it, it, this, I, this focus on competition, like why, right? Where did that come from? Well, I think it's, it's because they're competing with each other and very hierarchical and it makes sense from a male perspective. Um, women are more connectors. <laughs> I don't want to be, you know, too generalizing, but but we see relationships and um, and and it's like forestry developed without that vision, right? It was like have, being blind in one eye, only yeah. one perspective, which was the male perspective. And yeah. now, you know, we're saying, oh, you know, <laughs> now we see much more. We're seeing the fuller forest. We're bringing our full selves to the forest to see it, and it's gonna it's turned upside down. How the how we understand the forest as a as a functioning whole society, um, and yeah, I mean there are lots of remnants of oh that that's just girly talk or that doesn't matter or she's, I mean literally even in my own faculty you know that's just a bunch of whatever, um, and, and it happens today it's still going on but um, but you know what we just don't stop and the you know I, I encourage girls women you know, to get into these male dominated fields because we make enormous, the exciting thing is that when we get in, we make these enormous changes. Um, it's hard at first, especially for the pioneers that are in there, but eventually you see these, these big shifts and you see the men coming on board and then we start working together. And that is where we wanna be, is all of us working together because that creates the fullest picture. Um, so it's happening and, and it's exciting. Amen, sister. <laughs> I hope my daughter is watching. Um, well, I did wonder, and I think you've sort of touched on this, but just to probe it a little further, I mean, it seemed obvious to me that a woman's perspective helped open up these ideas, but you and I are both mothers. And I think in particular, not only because you called them the mother tree, but that concept of um, not only interconnectedness and communication, but um, as I read it and understood your work, some of these mother trees sacrificed their own uh, well-being to a degree to help the offspring rise. Those are concepts that felt to me very maternal. Not that men can't be paternalistic. I don't, my, my, if my husband's watching, I'll hear about that. But I did wonder if both being a woman and a mother helped you see and realize some of these things and understand them for what they were and, and led, led you to follow through in further investigating them in ways that might not have occurred to. Yeah. I don't, I honestly, I think you, you're all exactly right. You know, um, you know, I, I mean, and I have to say that the work that I did, men had been studying those things too, but not to the degree that I took it because I could see the value of this understanding. And 
and my uh, the questions I ask were very much shaped by me as a as a mother and a female, and and someone who grew up in forests. I think that the combination of those things gave me a perspective that allowed me to formulate the questions that I asked. That I don't think I haven't seen my male counterparts ask those same questions, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. Things, but um, yeah, it is important. And then also my even and as a mother and I got sick part way through, I got breast cancer. And then yeah. that also informed my work, right? Is the understanding of, of the mother tree and healing and healing myself and healing my community and relationships. And, um, and so I asked those questions and then I, next, you know, do kin, you know, does kin recognition, is it affected by sickness of the mothers? And I found out that it does, right? Um, the other thing that that led me to ask another question was about the medicines that I was receiving, which were, you know, actually Aboriginal medicines, Taxol, which we actually use in mainstream medicine. Yeah, yeah. But that came from Aboriginal knowledge. That's a defense molecule of the yew tree that we're using to defend ourselves against against illness as well. And so I asked the questions of the yew tree: Is would a mother tree or other, a community help you produce? more and better taxol. And I have a grad student doing that very thing for her doctoral research right now. Very so thing has led to the other for sure. So um, you've talked about this in a couple different places. I said we would come back to it. So I wanna, I wanna bring us to the issue of Aboriginal knowledge, Indigenous knowledge. You know, I think we're sort of skirting around the idea that as a woman, um, maybe your ideas were marginalized or harder to get into the mix. No question, at least in my country, that's been the case with indigenous knowledge. Um, I see that changing a little bit. We've had a very deep partnership with um, some of the indigenous people in our region. They have brought in understanding concepts around forest management and viewing. Uh, it's not just forest management. It's way more than just how to do a burn. It's, it's a very different way of thinking about our relationship with trees. And you've alluded to that as well. It's clear from things you've said and what you've written about that you found um, that knowledge pre-existed and we're just sort of retapping back into it. Are you seeing more acceptance of that indigenous knowledge, more incorporation of it into land management practices, into research? Or is it really only an I, you know, in our little region, I am seeing it, but it's very localized. And I'm curious what you're seeing on a broader scale. You know, we're getting, we're getting there. So, I mean, what a history that we could talk about this for an hour, but, um, or longer, but in Canada, you know, we're going through this enormous truth and reconciliation process, which it's got lots of bumps and, and, you know, failures and slowdowns and a few successes, but regarding your indigenous treatment of indigenous yeah people right, in the residential school system and yeah. just discrimination all over and just the disregard and ignoring the knowledge systems that were in place you know burying the languages burying the kids basically yeah. um, and and now you know we're we're the thank goodness our our aboriginal friends and relatives are um coming out of this trauma and, and yeah, I mean, a lot of people didn't survive, but a lot did. And, and they're still here and they're, they're, um, they're smart, they're educated, they're recovering their languages, they're recovering their old ways, they're working hard to do this, they're taking back their resources and their land. It's gonna be very, very, it's gonna be hard. Um, and of course, the, you know, the colonial government doesn't wanna give up anything that it took away. Um, yeah. But, but there's a recognition that this way of seeing the world, that we are all connected, that what I do to the tree does something back to me, yeah. um, that I need to look at. I have obligations to look after these trees. Yeah. It's my responsibility to look yeah. after these resources. We don't have that in our culture, but we have to get it back if we're going to survive this. Yeah. And um, one of the, the positive steps that I see, and this is a trauma, traumatic step but you know we just had in in british columbia 300 wildfires burned through our forests because the heat dome moved over british columbia and sat there and ignited 300 fires that have burned millions of hectares we haven't counted it all yet up yet but now they're saying oh you know we shouldn't have been suppressing fire i mean that's been that that sentiment has been around for a long time but not taken seriously and nothing yeah. about it and and then you know 
fire is ripping through the Aboriginal territories as well. And they're saying, well, well, you wouldn't let us do our spring burns. You wouldn't let us protect our forest. You wouldn't let us do the stewardship. And now, you know, we're the government is saying, oh, I mean, we've got a long way to go, but they're going, oh, maybe we should work together because we have a lot to learn from you. And so it is gonna come. It, it's gonna take a lot of us working on this and working together as a braid, as a co-community of indigenous and, and settler people to create a path forward, a new path. I mean, we can't go back. There's too many of us. We have global change. We can't go back exactly to the old ways, but we can create a new path that incorporates these principles of reciprocity, respect for nature, um, resilience in our systems. Yeah. Um, yeah. Diversity. Diversity. Yeah. All right. I could talk to you for a long time. I'm going to ask you one. I'm going to take facilitator's prerogative. I'm going to ask one last question, and then we'll turn it over to my colleague who's been monitoring the questions from our audience. This can be a quick one, but we haven't even talked about the fact that in addition to your book, um, that you were sort of highlighted in a fiction book, The Overstory, Pulitzer Prize winning book. Um, and one of the characters was modeled off of you, which I thought was just cool. It's a great <laughs> book. Um, and I'm just curious how the visibility and um, yeah, visibility that those things may have given you and your willingness to go and do things like this, um, has that made it harder or easier for you to get your ideas to be accepted? You know, I think it all helps, right? To, to get these ideas out into mainstream and it is getting more mainstream. Yeah. It takes, it takes many ways of communicating, not just one, it's not just one book, it's, it's an, more books, it's more perspectives on the same, you know, that diversity of ideas and how this, how this all fits together is really great. I love Richard Power's book. He did yeah. a wonderful job, what a beautiful piece of work. Um, I love, you know, Robert McFarlane's work and, and I love um, Merlin Sheldrake's work. It's all important. All of the art and the music. I was talking to an opera um, composer this morning. They created an opera of the forest based on networks. All of these different ways of communicating is important because we'll yeah. meet other people. And um, so it only helps, it helps me commu communicate my ideas because people can hook into these other ways of how they learn how they understand it, you know, it, it's not just, yeah, it's, it's all helpful. I think it's great. It's made my yeah. life easier. Yeah, good. That's good to hear. All right. I reluctantly am going to turn over the gavel to my colleague and let him um, share with us uh, the questions from our audience. Thank you. Thank you both for a very, very fascinating conversation. Um, we have a lot of questions, uh, several of them related to fire. Um, so I'll start with one. Um, as you know, Suzanne, we're still a, well. We're looking back at a year anniversary of a major fire in the region that largely happened within redwood forest networks. But within those networks are also other trees, including Douglas fir. Mm -hmm. And so this question is: What happens to Douglas fir networks when most of the trees are killed in a major fire? Yeah. Um, so you know. The fungal networks, of course, are reliant on photosynthate. They get their energy from the photosynthesis happening in the crowns of the trees. And if the trees are gone, those fungi also will go. Um, um, that said, you know, if um, it takes, often when a tree burns, um, not, not all trees affected in, with the same severity. So um, some will die right away um, and then their fungi disappear, you know, within a year. Um, some take longer to die, or maybe they recover, but their fungal, their ability to feed that fungal network goes down. Um, but um, these older trees, even if they're, 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 you know, have suffered or, but if they're still alive, they're going to support, you know, a, com a community that is correlated with the age of those trees. So even if an old Douglas fir dot, you know, is burned and, and, but it is still alive, it's going to be fostering that complex network of many, many species. Um, now, Douglas fir, of course, unlike the redwoods, doesn't sprout. <laughs> it regenerates by seed. And so if you've lost all the seed trees around those trees, then it's going to be really hard for Douglas fir to come back and regenerate. 
Um, and in that case, I think that where, you, where there are extensive burned areas and all the dug fir is gone, I don't know if that's true or not, that bringing, you know, planting Douglas fir will be important because these communities have evolved in these mixtures. And, you know, even though, you know, um, the redwoods and the Douglas fir are separate species, they're interdependent as well. Right. They, and I imagine that, you know, the Douglas firs probably, you know, suffered a bit more because they've got shorter crowns and the and the crown fires would have gone there and maybe not moved up into the redwood crowns. Um, but those redwoods would still be dependent on Douglas firs being around them to perform a bunch of services like providing seed for squirrels that will also, um, you know, play a functional role in the dispersal, for, for example, of fungi that help. Uh, colonize the redwoods. There, there would be many, many positive interactions between these trees. So it, it will be important to rejuvenate the Douglas fir in those forests as well using planting. And that is the scenario I think we're facing, which is this localized extirpation of Doug fir from yeah. redwood forests, more redwood dominant forests. So it'll, it is going to be important for us to pay attention to that. Yeah. I, I do have a couple questions on regeneration and uh, replanting. Um, uh, in terms of replanting, uh, you're, you know, th probably thinking about this a lot with the clear cutting that's happening there. What strategy would work best for replanting forests to be able to reabsorb the excess CO two that's in the atmosphere? Yeah, I, so I'm just going to start with one one thing that is just a basic principle, and that is that. You know, and, and maybe this is repeating what I said earlier, but there is no nothing that will replace an old forest in terms of its carbon storage and biodiversity. So if anybody is thinking, oh, you know, we can just replace old forests with plantations, and really there's been a lot of misinformation on that, uh, especially, you know, I think over the last couple of decades, as people have tried to make excuses for cutting down old forests, there is no, you can't, it, it would takes, it's going to take, you know, a hundred or more years for that forest to recover the biodiversity and carbon that st was stored in an old forest. So that's number one. And then um, if planting is needed, then, um, then there are things that, that, that you can do. So one is biodiversity, again, biodiversity um, in the plant community, including the trees, begets biodiversity in the rest of the community. So if, if so Douglas fir, but maybe there's other species of trees and definitely other species of the shrub community and herbaceous community should be fostered because they all, you know, they work together to drive the cycles, the nutrient cycles and so on. Um, and then the, I guess the other thing is, you know, we, we tend to <laughs> we tend to be farmers kind of sometimes when we think and we plant trees in rows and spaced apart and and actually in a natural forest there's a lot of complexity, right? You'll get a, a community developing in a rich area that or a, a wet area and you'll get quite a density and and that the different ages actually help each other out. And so to try to think when you're planting of of planting families and communities rather than rows of trees, because plants are very responsive to the soil. They're very responsive to their neighbors. They like to grow in groups. They like to communicate with each other. It provides them with resilience. Um, and so I would say, you know, try to put away your, your manicure uh, tendencies and, and, and make it messy, make it, you know, clustered and, and complex, like a complex network. That is really helpful. Thank you. I'm sure that you could speak for another hour on um, these pro probable techniques. Um, I have a lengthy question here, and I wanted to read it out because it's um, it's pretty well detailed, and I think gets to an interesting question on regeneration. In situations post fire, in many sea species, we see a flush of seedlings relatively soon post fire, like closed cone plant pine seedlings, uh, such as knob cone pine or even giant sequoia. And then over a period of years, there's a high level of seeding, seedling mortality. This suggests something more like competition rather than cooperation. Um, and the uh, questioner asks, you know, it says that they can imagine that the microbial network community may be affecting survival or proximity and connection to surviving older trees. Do you have any thoughts on whether or how these factors are determining which seedlings make it? Yeah, um, good, great question. So you're absolutely right, the questioner that you know, w when the initial seed flush comes and you get regeneration, there's a, a flush of seedlings and then there's mortality. And eventually, you know, you, you end up with a, a forest that you, you might go from 
thousands of seedlings per hectare. Like that's what we get in our forest is maybe 10,000 seedlings per hectare. And the mature forest is maybe 600 trees per hectare. So obviously there's a lot of self thinning that goes on in that process of aging. Um, and so, you know, what, what happens is that, you know, the seeds will fall in all these different places and different microsites and they have all kinds of factors that determine how successful they'll be. So, you know, where they happen to land, what parent tree was nearby, what their genetics are, um, you know, what the neighboring herbaceous community, and, the, and there's a, there is a, a multiplicity of interactions going on between all of these trees and plants that determine who are the survivors. And that multiplicity of interactions includes competition, competition for light and water, but it also includes collaboration and it includes parasitisms. It includes all these different kinds of positive and negative interactions. It's no one single thing. And I think that we've tended to think that, oh, it's that they thin out just because of competition. That's not, that's only part of the story. They thin out also just because of who gets left behind at, or who is smaller and um, gets a slower head start. Um, who is, is genetically weaker to maybe to resist certain pathogens, um, which ones are, you know, more, um, you know, more able to, uh, to, to sequester nutrients from neighboring plants. There's all kinds of factors. Um, um, but that, so, so the main, main message here is to, to not just think about competition in this respect, because that is part of it, but there's this wide array, this complex interactions, these complex communications. And I often use this analogy of, you know, when we're communicating in our societies, think of a human or a classroom and the kids are all learning and there's a teacher and there's all these ways that these kids are communicating with each other. They're, they're talking, they're running, they're, they're drawing pictures, they're coloring. Um, they might, you know, they might slug their buddy or they might play marbles with them. Those are all ways of making those cohesive community. Um, and so in a forest, it's the same thing. It's there's all these different ways that these plants and all the other creatures are interacting that includes not just collaboration or, and, and not just competition, but many, many ways of interacting. And we need to foster the, the full breadth of those relationships. That's what builds a healthy, resilient forest. Just because, just like that builds a healthy, resilient classroom that will go on to be a healthy, resilient society. So um, unfortunately, I think we're running out of time. Um, and I'm gonna say something I don't wanna sound, I will sound hokey, so I'll just apologize in advance. But um, you really are a hero to me and many other people, <laughs> women and otherwise. And just listening to you talk and thinking about it, I feel like the role you are playing is very analogous to the role of the mother tree. In so many ways, I won't beat the metaphor to death, but thank you for that. It's profound. So I offer profound gratitude. Thank you. Um, and uh, thank you for sharing your thinking with us. We are gonna wanna come back and talk to you again as much as we can, and especially about what to do about our Doug furs. But um, I just want you to go and do more <laughs> great work. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I want to thank our audience. I'm sorry we can't get to every one of your questions. We will try to follow up with Suzanne with as many of them as we can or get you the answers ourselves. But thank you to our audience for sharing in this worldview and in passion for these forests. Um, and I hope you will join us for our next webinar month when we will be joined by another renowned ecologist, this time a, forest, a fire ecologist, Scott Stevens. Uh, Professor Scott Stevens, who is going to talk to us more about fire and resilience. He also has spent a lot of time thinking about indigenous knowledge and how to bring that into the mix. Um, he's amazing, but he, I don't know if he can hold a candle to you, Suzanne. So I'm sure. with I'm that, sure. with my, I'll end on my fangirl note and just say, you know, thank you so much for sharing uh, your thoughts uh, with us and for all the work that you're doing. Thank you, Susan. Thank you for, or Sarah, thank you very much for having me. And um, I really appreciate it. Well, we look forward to future conversations with you. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye.